know this sounds corny, but I think meditating to Satoshi's image. Tell me something I don't know. Everybody's gonna load into a rocket and Elon Musk is gonna take everybody to the moon. I was gonna ask you a bunch of uh, legal questions. I'm not an alcoholic anymore, leave me alone. I used to be an alcoholic. Well, you know, you can't be sexy all the time, right? Your previous girlfriend, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> previous girlfriend, exactly. Yeah. My previous girlfriend, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hey guys, this is Catherine Ross. We're here with Julian Zegelman in Las Vegas. So thanks for joining us. I was gonna ask you a bunch of uh, legal questions, but you've mentioned that you're not a lawyer anymore. How did that happen? Right, so you know, so it's like being a recovering alcoholic. You know, when you've been drinking for a long time and people remember like you used to drink, not that I would know, you know, I, I personally don't drink, but you go to meetings and everybody's like, oh, you were an alcoholic. And the person was like, I'm not an alcoholic anymore, leave me alone. Like, I like skiing now. Or snowboarding, like, you know, one of the cameramen. <laughs> okay. so, so I used to be a lawyer for a very long time, but in parallel, I was always drawn to business, and I was always drawn to creativity of business, which to me was creating new opportunities. Mm -hmm. And so in parallel to being a lawyer, I was an entrepreneur. I uh, co-founded four companies. Uh, two of them got acquired, two of them failed. Uh, I learned a lot from that. And I in 2000, imagine. yeah, well, well, yeah. I mean, I <laughs> yeah. learned a lot from the failures. And so what do you do now? So what I do now is I'm a general partner at TMT Blockchain Fund, which is a venture capital fund Ooh, investing so in blockchain questions. technology. <laughs> so many questions. Excellent. Okay, so what does a regular VC company do in the crypto space? So you're only focused on crypto projects? So I like the word blockchain mm -hmm. because it's, okay. and you bring a wonderful distinction yeah. because I like to bring the distinction beca uh, between three separate but related things, which is blockchain as a technology, tokenization and token economics as a socioeconomic mm -hmm. phenomena, and cryptocurrencies, which oh. everybody's excited about, and today everybody's sad about it, and I, don't, I haven't even looked. I don't even know what it is today. I Could see. 30,000 per Bitcoin falling. So care. you prefer the blockchain part of it, right? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So you focus on blockchain projects? Yes. That would be correct? So what we do at TMT Investments, and our background is in traditional venture capital. It sounds like you're pitching somebody. So what we do at ah. TMT, okay, I'm joking, go on. Oh, no, and, and you're happy to invest. We still, you know, we've raised, yeah, we've raised okay, a portion of the fund. Right, right okay. always, you got to pitch when Las yeah, Vegas. Okay. Maybe you won a lot of money yesterday and okay, you want to deploy some of that Wait, into venture capital. Wrong. Absolutely. Okay. Okay, cool. So what we do in the real life language, we invest in companies that happen to use blockchain to solve real life problems. In other words, they've got customers and customers pay them money or will pay the money in the foreseeable future. And we bet on the fact that somebody will buy their product. Mm -hmm. So how do you research for a product? How do you do your due, due diligence? So I'm going to be very contrarian and very boring and entirely non-sexy right now. <laughs> So all the flashing, well, you know, you can't be sexy all the time, right? I mean, you got to take a vacation from that too sometimes. Yeah, okay, I'm going to be sad for a while. Okay, Go on. and then you'll recover. <laughs> okay. right. I'll okay. put the sexy, you know, face on a little later. But the way we look at it is in a very traditional, boring way. Mm -hmm. All the flashy Lamborghinis, um, big conferences, people saying they're going to wipe out the banking system, they're going to wipe out the government, everybody's going to load into a rocket and Elon Musk is going to take everybody to the moon of course, in exchange for tokens. Elon Musk. Yeah. It's got great entertainment potential, but we don't invest there. Uh huh. So I talked to a lot of university research groups. I talked to some of the leading blockchain research groups at Stanford, for example, MIT, Caltech, uh, Oxford, etc. I talk to people who are leaving large corporations and sometimes leaving the blockchain teams at large corporations to launch something else. I look at serial entrepreneurs. I look at coders. We go to a lot of hackathons. We look in places where there are people who are going to build real technology. And then we dig deeper and we look at real technologies that could solve actual problems. And then we dig even deeper and we say, how do you build a sexy product or a service out of this combination of a real technology that gives a solution to a real life need? Mm -hmm. So from your standpoint, uh, this product or their future actions mm -hmm. does not necessarily involve ICOs, right? Most of the time it doesn't. And I want to be preface that with the fact that we have invested in ICOs and we probably will continue to invest in ICOs. So we've invested both in some large uh, 
very large, very high profile ICOs, and a lot of our portfolio right now is confidential, but we've done that. And also we've invested in what we call special situations, mm -hmm. which is uh, especially early in 2017, we looked at opportunities that we believed had very good short-term profit potential, but we did not necessarily want to stay in them long-term. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we entered and we exited, and some of them we still hold a portion, et cetera, but that's probably maybe 20% of the fund. 80% of the fund is bridging the world of traditional venture capital, which is catching up slowly, but still behind on the blockchain curve, with the potential, the explosive potential that blockchain as a platform technology holds. Also to the tokenization part of that. Absolutely. You do not want to work with that project? No, and that's very interesting because we, we believe that tokenization is very related and oftentimes same as ICOs, but ICO is a fundraising mechanism. And there are companies out there, not a lot, but we believe there's going to be more and more that use tokens, but they don't do an ICO. They either have funding already or they use other more conventional mechanisms. We believe that tokenization will be a huge wave in the peer-to-peer -peer economy, marketplaces, e-commerce. It's probably to the future what some of the early credit card processing companies over the internet were to the internet in mid to late 90s. So we're very excited especially about existing mid-sized companies with big growth curve and robust internal economies mm -hmm. that could be switched into tokens. So let's say you've got a company with loyalty points mm -hmm. and it's growing and people are using those points, yep. not just saying, ah, I got another point, what the hell am I gonna do with it? And you know, forget their passwords. <laughs> but they actually use it, that's a beautiful candidate to switch tokens for points, introduce some cost savings, introduce ease of trade, transparency, all the things we like to talk about that blockchain brings. That's a wonderful example of tokenization done right and a great investment opportunity. VCs firms have, you know, it seems like they have been pretty much away from the industry. Mm -hmm. Why do you think is that? Wonderful question. Um, I think personally, and I think that's changing. Mm -hmm. yeah. More and more traditional VCs. Andreas and Horvitz, our colleagues there, yeah, just raised a big year fund. Is this also, year yeah, it, yeah. It is, the interest is definitely increasing, but the not so high, I would say, still. I think two factors. Mm -hmm maturity of the technology and the market, and also the risk profile. I think in 2014, 2015, the market was too small and the things that were VC grade were very few. And typically it was hardware solutions, some early mining opportunities, for example, Bitfury mm -hmm. was initially venture backed, um, you know, the, the, one of the largest Bitcoin, yes. yeah. And so there was this you know, tiny universe of opportunities and the VC finding, I think the statistics, don't quote me on that, but I think in all of 2016, something like $40 million at most was invested into blockchain by VCs. Mm -hmm. And obviously ICOs was a lot more. That's changing. So I think maturity of the technology in the market and risk profile. So maturity, it was too early. Mm -hmm. And finally now the technology is further along Risk profile, if you remember what was going on in 2016 and 17, it was all ICOs. If you had a blockchain project back then, I knew people who would look at term sheets, sometimes term sheets from our fund, sometimes term sheets from another fund, and I would say thank you so much, but no thanks, and within three weeks they had their ICO website up, and within a month they would raise three times the money they got offered from VCs, entirely non-diluted, meaning they wouldn't even have to give up anything. Mm -hmm. You know, they say, oh, I have a utility token, let's go. I have 40 million now. And you know, why would they give up a third of the company for 10 million? Yeah. That market is changing. And VCs, we didn't want to get into that because A, that's insane, you know, and B, the risk profile, the legislation wasn't there, um, the understanding of what will happen after. Well, yeah, wasn't so there. it's kind of a gray area and extremely, VCs yeah, probably don't like gray. gray area. Yeah, VCs don't like gray area because think about it. Um, Think about like you starting a new relationship and your partner is bipolar. And I mean, I don't mean to be mean to anybody with a psychological condition, but I just try to bring some light. That's a gray area for your future. A new relationship is gray area anyways. A new relationship with a bipolar person is like going into space with high, no, high you know. High risk ratio, right? Now. High risk ratio, yeah. and that's what, you know, yeah. I see who investing great, is. Great example. A startup <laughs> is risky. Any startup, yeah. and then you, you, know, you snap the uncertainty of ICO and uh, unregulated markets on top of that, that's like risk on dynamite. 
I see. Do you think we will see more interest from the VC's point? I think absolutely. And I think what was very telling is deals like Telegram, Filecoin, et cetera, which technically are private ICOs, if you think about it, because they were selling tokens, but they did it in compliance with applicable securities laws, very similar to the way they would have done a large venture capital deal. So I think we're going to see more VC money going into regulated token sales, especially if the liquidity improves for the tokens, and we see that already. And I also think that certain, for example, B2B business-to-business -business, uh, companies have blockchain solutions that have no use for tokens. And those are raising money quietly from VCs the same way um, any other type of company would raise. So I think VC money is definitely flowing into the space, uh, but it's still, I think, early. I don't think it's a common phenomenon yet. I've looked through your social media platforms just to prepare for the interview, okay. and I saw that you advise a lot of projects, is that correct? Uh, I used to. I used to. So sometimes I'm a firm believer that you learn by doing, okay. and right now I'm focused on advising a few select companies that are in our portfolio, in the fund's portfolio. I don't do any additional advisory work, but the period from probably 2015 to 2017, I was advising uh, quite a few companies. What does an advisor do for a crypto company? So I can talk about my, my experience, yeah. uh, because I think, you know, there was a huge, you know, like difference, difference uh, what and people were doing. And that depends on your expertise, obviously. Expertise and the company stage and what's expected. So I was always focusing on, you know, two core areas of expertise, which I have. Mm -hmm. One is legal compliance and risk management. Your that previous one. girlfriend, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> previous girl, exactly. Yeah. My previous girlfriend, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one was on corporate development. So recruiting other advisors, recruiting early customers, what is the strategy to get business partners, etc. How do you make the project more sustainable and real early on? So that's what I used to do a lot as an entrepreneur, you know, getting partnerships, getting early corporate investors. So when I advise the projects, that's the two areas I focused on. What, in your opinion, professional obviously, uh, what is the biggest issue a blockchain or crypto or token, tokenization related project have at this point? Well, I think it's the fact that in real world today, we still, I think, two to four years away from when the technology and the customer education and the market need converges in this enormous you know, uh, wave of growth and economic growth. So the issue is very simple. A lot of companies in blockchain space at light years behind where they need to be for traditional VC funding. And that used to be okay because the ICO mechanism was there. And that's still sort of okay this year because there's a lot of new VCs jumping into the space, willing to try it out. But I don't know if it's going to be okay next year. Yeah. For example, if you run a software company, you need to have a, at least minimum viable product, early customers, early traction. There are metrics on how much money you're going to be making a month to raise. Well, we'll we all around. saw the Silicon Valley, yeah, yeah TV yeah. series. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> In blockchain, oftentimes people come to you and say, look, I've got this idea for a new blockchain protocol and I just published a research paper on it and I'm going to raise 20 million. And it's exciting and scary because they may be the next Google or this may be a lab experiment to the tune of $20 million. So the trust and uh, uncertainty are the main mm. issues, yeah? I think trust, uncertainty, and we're still early in terms of market adaption. There is a problem with market adaption. Uh, so what do, we, what do we need to do to, bring, to, you know, to build the bridge between the, this particular problem? Well, I think looking back at previous uh, cycles, mm -hmm. I think the killer, t uh, two things. I think the overall consumer education is not there yet. I think the, amount, the solutions on the market today, for example, crypto wallets, crypto exchanges, etc., they're still for the blockchain geeks. I think as more people pay attention to user interfaces, ease of use, regulatory compliance and regulatory ease of use, etc., some of the applications we all in the industry think may be the killer apps, they'll start to gain more momentum and that's going to push the market forward. Because right now, this is still a very closed-ended community. Much larger than it was when I first got into the space in 2014, grew immensely. 
how would you get a person excited about the industry? Well, just a regular person on the street, mm -hmm. what would you tell them? Hey, have you heard about this blockchain technology? How to get excited? It's very simple. Uh, and I know this sounds corny, but this is Internet 3.0. Or 4.0, or whatever. You know, I lose track. I mean, I'm, uh, you know, I got into the uh, tech space in mid mid 90s oh. when it was the internet 1.0, and we didn't even know it was 1.0. So it is the new internet, the new internet of peer-to-peer -peer interactions, peer-to-peer -peer commerce. A lot of the big ideas are real, and I believe in them. Mm -hmm. Just like, but I also don't believe just like internet did not change every single human activity. Right? If you want to play tennis with a friend, you still go and play tennis with a friend. Similarly, I don't think blockchain will be an answer for all you know, commercial and, and social needs, but I think it's going to impact a lot of areas of our life. And as we go along further, it's going to impact more and more. But uh, did you work with the legal side of the crypto Yes, industry? a lot, absolutely. Yeah. That's so, how I first got into it. Yeah, I have a question. How yes. did a lawyer uh, how does a lawyer become a crypto lawyer? Mm -hmm. So he, they just woke, wake up and, and become one? Or how does that happen? Is, are there any courses, uh, trainings, or? I think meditating to Satoshi's image. Uh, that, that's it? That's uh, it. You meditate. So and, I uh, and might as well become Satoshi a crypto touches lawyer. You. Absolutely. Oh, I see. <laughs> no. I, I always thought, what's, what's up with that? <laughs> and then you see Satoshi and you know you're done. Uh, of course. Of course. Yeah, I have a pretty great sticker, but it's Vitalik. There you go. That's yeah. it. Oh, that's good too. Yeah, that's you know, everybody too. has their own beliefs, right? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's got their own. Oh, Bobby Lee, right? Uh, if you're into Litecoin, you can meditate okay, too, can Bobby Lee. Just, like, I'm going to touch him. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There I'll you go. Back. I'll be back. <laughs> but no, seriously enough, you touched up on an excellent point that I think is uh, we did a legal panel earlier today mm -hmm. and we had different lawyers, all of them very active in blockchain. And with different expertise. Different right? expertise. Yeah. And I think being a blockchain lawyer is a question as well. What's blockchain? It's securities law, it's privacy law, it's contracts, it's enforcement. But I've always thought that it's as it's technology, mm -hmm. can it be considered a technology? Can it be regulated as a technology? I think it is a technology. It still but causes like, a lot of issues. But, you know, I think technology, I think you need to have a general understanding of technology and the love for technology and the ability to learn and adapt fast. And then you need to have an underlying solid foundation in an area low that's imposed that's you know that that's impacted by blockchain because i know criminal lawyers who are blockchain lawyers they help people when there is you know a criminal matter and there is cryptocurrency involved i know litigators who are blockchain litigators because they've done enough cases to understand some unique aspects a lot of securities lawyers make great blockchain lawyers because now more and more tokens are regulated as securities what, to your opinion, is the most crypto-friendly, blockchain, tokenization-friendly country so far? Well, there are a few. I mean, I'm personally a huge fan of Malta. Because you just like the climate. I love the climate <laughs> and the people. Yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. I knew it. And you can swim there. It's a little harsher to swim in Gibraltar. Uh, but, but I... <laughs> and the food is great, right? <laughs> and the food is great, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what? Let's let's make everybody go to Malta. I they need more conferences in Malta. Malta. Yeah, blockchain in Malta, absolutely. <laughs> any, any another country except Malta? Um, frankly, you know, I think um, one on a hidden gem that actually gets a lot of deals done, but people don't think about it, is Cayman Islands. Oh, yeah. Uh, especially for setting up blockchain funds, mm -hmm. setting up certain larger deals, etc. Because on one hand, it's an established jurisdiction with decades of interactions with all the key onshore jurisdictions like US, European Union, Asia, etc. Um, it's got great banking infrastructure and some of the banks are now getting into the blockchain space. And it's, um, it's not inundated by blockchain projects to a point where there's a lot of noise and there's a line because I remember uh, this happened to Singapore. You know, everybody wanted to Singapore, the good guys and the bad guys. And then Singapore, I think the regulators get a little scared and said, ooh, let's take a break. But Singapore is now overcrowded with the project. I think overcrowded. Yeah. There is regulators now understand what's happening and there is more scrutiny, which is good. I think that's a good process. But I think it's just you know, this fashion fad for the next great jurisdiction. I wonder when it's going to be over. Right, because every year a new country says we're the crypto, you know, 
Uh, when they do it four times in a row in two years, it's becoming it's it's becoming comical. Okay, so this is just a PR stunt for a com for a country might be as well. Well, no, and I, and I think it's not always a PR stunt. I think there's countries who are actually doing a lot in that space, mm -hmm. and that's great, and it's great that they're the innovators. But they think it's you know to a company who thinks that they're going to become successful just because they're registered in country X and not country Y. I think that's a very immature understanding of the market. Mm -hmm. So you just you you think that a company should be based there as well and to play by the rules? I think it's that a company needs right? to understand its business model, needs to understand the legal and licensing requirements applicable, and, and then needs to potential users probably potential users, banking system, find partners, find a bank that's willing to bank it, understand which jurisdictions that bank is very comfortable with, which not so comfortable, and then make the decision. As opposed to, oh wow, you know, I saw this on um, Coin Telegraph. Malta is uh, great for blockchain. I got me a ticket to Malta. You know, let me register a Maltese company. But I've come across, you know, serial ICO entrepreneurs. It's that gal or guy who's at, you know, five conferences a month for the past three years, and every three months they get a new company in a new met jurisdiction. I've a lot of them. Yes, yes. <laughs> we all have, yes. and they're great people and they're entertaining, but. Uh, I feel like you know you show them the map of the world, and they know the world by crypto-friendly jurisdiction. They're like, "Oh, Singapore, Gibraltar, Malta, Isle of Man, yeah. you know, Mauritius." Like, so the question I I just have to ask is: Are you a crypto trader yourself? Yes, I am. I am. I'm embarrassed to say, but I am embarrassed. Embarrassed to Why say. Why that particular? Well, word? because a lot of uh, you know, it's interesting when you talk to a lot of VCs. Uh, I'm a very uh, atypical, I think, representative of the industry because you know I tend to I tend to be serious in investing, but not other things. Um, and a lot of folks in the VC industry feel that crypto trading is very volatile. Very Tell me something illogical. I don't know, right? <laughs> right, etc. And yeah. they stick on what they know. Um, I trade, I trade, um, uh, I trade in a very careful manner, but I trade. This reminds me of the, the beginning of the conversation. I'm used to be an alcoholic. I yeah, trade. Yeah, I trade. Yeah, I trade. no, because you know, it's like, for, there was a time when I was trading a lot, and uh, it's interesting. It still sounds like an alcoholic <laughs> meeting. Okay. It really is because you get addicted. You know, you get addicted. You you know, you call. You know, I, I was trading uh, on my own, then I had a trader. Uh, that, that I still work with. Um, he was a wonderful, wonderful trader. But you know, it's like you get addicted. You look at this, you're like, oh, it's up, it's down. It's... And you never sleep. And that's, you never sleep, exactly, because you, know, you do the deals, you talk to people. A lot and, of the deals are outside of the and US. The crypto markets are open 24 7. They're so. open 24 7, right. Yeah. Okay, so do you have any, any kind of recommendations for a p person who's just entering the market and would like to trade? Mm -hmm. Not invest, trade. Do you have any recommendations, personal? Personally? Personally, yeah. Well, it's the same advice somebody told me the very first time I wrote my first angel investor check. Um, I was probably in my mid to late 20s. I got a bonus at a law firm I was working at, and I, wanted, you know, I thought about, okay, what can I do with it? I can you know, put it into my pension fund, but gosh, I'm like 26. I can put it into a startup company. And I asked the mentor, and the mentor said, you know what? Do whatever you want, but make sure the amount is not larger than what you can afford to lose. And anytime anybody's asking me about trading, Bitcoin, futures, horses, whatever it is, I say, you know, educate yourself, read a lot, uh, form your own strategy if you can, watch what others are doing, have a diversified portfolio, the modern portfolio theory works, but most importantly, don't put all of your money in there. Like, you know, if you're not sleeping at night worrying about your crypto portfolio. You're not doing it right? You're not doing it right. It's an extremely volatile asset class with a much, much higher risk profile than any you know, other similarly liquid uh, instruments out there. I see. Okay, thank you so much for thank your time you. and this thank you for great. being with us. Okay. Yeah. Cointelegraph. Like, subscribe, and hodl.